بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله وسلم وبارك وبارك على رسول الله أما بعد الحافظ ابن رجب رحمه الله تعالى says ومن علامات العلم النافع أن صاحبه لا يدع العلم ولا يفخر به على أحد ولا ينسب غيره إلى الجهل إلا من خالف السنة وأهلها فإنه يتكلم فيه غضبا لا لا غضبا لنفسه ولا قصدا لرفعتها على أحد وقال قبل هذا ومن علامات العلم النافع طيب ابن رجب رحمه الله تعالى يقول هنا ويظهر منهم من قبول المنح واستجلابه مما ينافي الصدق والإخلاص فإن الصادق يخاف النفاق على نفسه ويخشى على نفسه من سوء الخاطمة أو الخاطمة فهو في شغل شاغل عن قبول المدح واستحسانه ولهذا كان من علامات أهل العلم النافع أنهم لا يرون لأنفسهم حالا ولا مقاما ويقرهون بقبولهم من تزكية والمدح ولا يتكبرون على أحد قال الحسن إنما الفقيه الزاهد في الدنيا الراغب في الآخرة البصير بدينه المواظب على عبادة ربه وفي رواية عنه أنه قال الذي لا يحسد من فوقه ولا يسخر من من دونه ولا يأخذ على علم علمه الله أجراء وهذا الكلام الأخير قد روي معناه عن ابن عمر من قوله وأهل العلم النافع كلما ازدادوا من هذا العلم ازدادوا لله تواضعا وخشية وانكسارا وظلا قال بعض السلف ينبغي للعالم أن يضع التراب على رأسه تواضعا لربه فإنه كلما ازداد علما بربه ومعرفة به ازداد منه خشية ومحبة وازداد له ظلا وانكسارا He says here from the signs of non-beneficial knowledge is people love to be praised they love to be lauded they love to be applauded they love to have people clapping and raising and cheering for them which goes against truthfulness goes against al-ikhlas because the true person the real person is he who fears nifaq He's afraid that he'll die in a bad state. So all of the time he's busy. And he has no time for sitting down and wanting and desiring for the people to praise him and give him a pat on the back and cheers up and thumbs up. He has, he has no time for this. Ibn Rajab Rahimullah then says, and this reason is why you see the people of beneficial knowledge, they don't look at themselves to be anything special. They don't look to have any special station or status above others. They dislike praise, nor do they have any type of pride or arrogance against others. They don't behave in a haughty manner against others. Hassan al-Basri, he said that the faqih is the one who is zahid. Who divorces the worldly pleasures and the one who desires the hereafter he who clearly sees the affairs of his deen and he who is consistent in worshiping his Lord this uh, athar here was mentioned another version of it that uh, Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah was asked a question about a mas'ala fiqhiyya an issue of fiqh and when he gave his answer, the questioner said, "Ma hakatha yaqul al He said that the, the doctors of fiqh they don't say this. That's not their view. And that Hassan al Basri rahimahullah is quoted to have said, "Wa haka, wa hal raita faqihan." He says, "Woe to you! Have you seen the faqih lately?" And then he said that the faqih is such and such and such and such and such and such. Back to the speech of Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he says. Another version states that the faqih is he who has no jealousy for those who are above him, nor do they mock and make fun of those who are beneath them, nor do they take monetary means for that which they teach, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them of knowledge, uh, and they give it to others, they don't take money for it. 
He says, and the last part of this athar was narrated from Ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Very important points here. Not to envy those who have more knowledge than you. Those who have more talent than you. Those who are above you and before you do not envy them. And this is something which is very sad. Uh, and I would say one of the greatest cancers of our times. Among those who consider themselves to be tulab al-ilm. And attribute themselves to knowledge and to da'wah and to sunnah and to the way of the salaf. You find many problems among the people. And from the greatest of them is hasad, is envy, pure envy and jealousy. And oftentimes the envy is disguised, is perfumed, there's a uh, masquerade, there's paint and makeup that's placed on the ugly face of hasad. Oh, well, it's not jealousy, but it's advice. Oh, we're not envious, but we just want good for him. Oh, and Keva, and Keva, and oh, and well, Ya'ni. They mask their envy, waliyadu billah. But at the end of the day, it's nothing more than hasid. And some people are mad and upset that Fulan is better than them. That Allah gave Fulan something that He didn't give them at a younger age with more strength, more ability, more talent. He allowed this person to go overseas longer, to study longer, to memorize more, to achieve more. To progress more, to be accepted among the people, for the people to love him, for him to have a closer status with this sheikh and these scholars and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, unfortunately, so the concept of hasid is very dangerous, and we spoke on it before. The types of hasid and the rulings of the types of hasid uh, in the biography of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, and what took place among Imam al-Bukhari. We could give twenty lectures on this, and it still wouldn't be enough. And it's very sad, these people, they claim to be upon the way of the Salaf Salih. But day and night, when they speak, when they talk, when they do things, the driving force behind those actions and statements is clearly hasad. It's clearly jealousy and envy. But because these people, they're not stupid people, they know very well that hasad is haram and that hasad is ugly and no one really likes it. No one with a sound mind, let alone with a soft heart, a Muslim is not going to accept hasid. So they have to polish it, they have to paint it, they have to coat it, they have to give it another term or another name. He made a mistake, we're refuting his mistake, we're giving him advice, oh there are people that are older than him, oh there are brothers that should be doing it, wakada wakada. Unfortunately, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. He says, nor do these people look down upon those who are beneath them and make fun of them mock them and ridicule them, those who are younger, those who have less talent, they don't make fun of them, okay? Uh, however, obviously there are details with regards to someone who is beneath you, who wishes to be above you. Someone who has less knowledge, less talent, someone who has less ability, someone who may not be able to speak Arabic, but then they go to refute you, and then they go to try to make fun of you and prove that you're wrong and that you're in error and that you, you're ignorant. So sometimes, not all of the times, a person may have to defend himself and refute the claims that are said about him or her and clearly show the ignorance and the stupidity, the foolishness and the buffoonery of those who are talking about him who may be beneath him. Sometimes this is mandatory. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly shows us in the Quran and Kareem that those who defend themselves and those when someone transgresses the boundaries against them, hum yantasirun. Allah tells us, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابُوا هُمْ الْبَغِي And those when baghi, aggression and transgression falls on them, huh, they strike back and they defend themselves. So sometimes a person has to do this. The last part of the Athar says, nor does he take money for knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught him. In other words, Allah gave it to you for free, so why take money for it? Why charge money for it? So when a person teaches and gives knowledge, he shouldn't take money for it. And it should be available for free. It should be available for free. Obviously, there's not a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Rather, we have hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ that speak about taking money for the Qur'an. And that's an issue of difference of opinion among the ulama 
is it permissible for a person to take something, take money for knowledge? And there's also an issue that was uh, viewed in different ways among the people of Hadith. And many of them, such as Imam Muhammad and others, they looked down upon scholars of Hadith that took money for narrations, that gave Hadith for money. The question is now, does this apply to Dawah? If a student of knowledge or an imam or a scholar goes to a place and gives a lecture and they give him an honorarium, they pay him. Or some places they may demand that he accept an honorarium and it's part of a contract. And if a person does not accept the honorarium, the lodging, uh, the meals, so on and so forth, then a person... They may say, we can't accept your, you coming. We cannot invite you because this is policy. All right? Or if there is no agreement, if a person goes somewhere and he gives a talk, and somebody walks up to him and says, here, Akhi, tafaddal, this is a gift for you, for your family. You traveled, you were tired, and so on and so forth. You benefit us. It's a gift. You have bills, you have necessities. Is that permissible? Does that fall under this? Taking ujra for tahdith? Does that mean that? That's a discussion in itself. Also, the concept of a person stipulating money and saying that I cannot come to you. I will not come to you. I will not give you a lecture. I will not do the khutbah unless you pay me $1,000 for this khutbah. Unless you pay me $5,000 for this khutbah. Unless you give me 25% of the fundraiser, of the, the, the funds, etc. Is it permissible to stipulate? Hmm? A person is traveling, uh, there obviously are logistical things going on, hotel, train, car, plane, family, busy, schedule, etc. Is it permissible for a person to stipulate and say that you must have to, you have to pay me for my time? That's another issue. A third issue is the concept of teaching, actual ta'lim, a person being a teacher, okay, in which he is re required to come in at a certain time. And he's not allowed to leave until after a certain time. And a person is uh, required to do and perform a certain task to a certain amount of people to reach a certain level and to finish a curriculum. Is that the same as tahdith? Is that the same? Okay. Or a person being an imam. That's work. is a full-time job and more. More than a full-time job. Okay. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly knows. Okay, and some of the slaves of Allah may realize it, some imams, some people who are close to imams, how much an imam actually has to work. And there is no nine to five. There is no time in which I'm off. His day off, he gets questions. If he cuts off his phone and he silences his phone, he puts it on airplane mode, he's with his children, his wife and his family, he runs into a brother in the mall. He runs into a brother at the restaurant. He's sitting in the park playing soccer with his kids and he sees a brother. Ah, oh, Sheikh, I have a really important question, please. He can't just say, no, it's my day off, please go away. Okay, an emergency phone call at 2 a.m. Please, Akhi, I got into a fight with my wife, so on and so forth. She did this to me. I pronounced the talaq the third time. She's mincing, blah, 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 does it count? Okay, and the list goes on of different examples that we can make on how imams oftentimes work 24-7. So is it permissible for them to stipulate and to make contracts and not only make contracts and stipulations, but request relative large sums of money? You have to pay me such and such amount of dollars every week, every two weeks, every month, so on and so forth. Is that permissible or is that haram? And uh, the concept of akhdur ujrati ala tahdith, a person narrating a hadith and asking for money. And a person saying that I won't give you hadith unless you give me money. These are all different ins and outs of this issue, which we don't have time to discuss right here, right now. This is just the beginning and our style of stimulating your mind to getting into the mas'ala, how the issue is to be understood and from where do you take and where do you go. With regards to taking wealth for something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you, teaching knowledge. Khayran inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And last but not least, very important concept, extremely important for the students of knowledge, is a person being free. A person being free to study and to teach. Okay? Many people, they say, well, this athar clearly states, don't take anything from knowledge that Allah has given you. So therefore, I'll teach the classes, I'll be the imam, I'll do the khutbas, but I will not take any money. 
Don't give me anything. A gift, a house, nothing. And that's fine. If that's what the brother feels he should do. Or the sister says, I'll do it all class for free. Please don't give me anything. But now the brother or the sister has bills. You have children. You have a husband. You have a wife. You have clothes that you need. Shoes, socks. And different expenses of the dunya. Let alone in 2016. No matter how humble your lifestyle is. Okay. Uh, you want to go travel, make hajj, make umrah. Go study some more. You books. You want to buy books. You want to read on your iPad, internet. Electric, etc. How are you going to pay for those? How, what are you going to do? What's your budget? You work for eight hours out of the day? Six hours out of the day? You work for six days a week, five days a week? When do you have the time and the energy to teach in the masjid? When do you have the time and the energy? I'm not talking about a class here or there, but we're talking about devoting yourself to teaching. Teaching full time, studying full time, being a true disciple. Devoting yourself to the way of knowledge. When do you have time to do that in, real, in reality? And is it wise and smart for any man or student of knowledge to have two minds, to have two hearts? I work eight hours, nine hours, ten hours, and I also teach and do this. Okay, you have time to teach when you're off work. You have extra energy, alhamdulillah. But when do you have time to make review and prepare? No matter what you memorize, no matter what you study, no matter how smart you are, you need time to review. And the way of the people of Hadith is to make reviews, to prepare for the class, prepare for the lesson, review the information before you talk, before you speak, review the Qur'an. You've memorized the Qur'an, but you have to make muraja of the Qur'an. So the concept of, yeah, I and mean, just in general, even in the times of the Salaf al but especially now, when things are so expensive, when do you have the time to free yourself? And those ulama who produced what they produced and wrote what they wrote and taught what they taught, they only did it because they had tafarruq. They were free. Whether because they had wealth that they had inherited, they had businesses that they had people in charge of, whatever the case may be, or they just chose poverty, whatever the case may be, they were free. They were free. And oftentimes a person, not just being free, but also being comfortable, to be able to produce knowledge. Let's just make an example of this today. We look at certain governments, certain countries, uh, okay, the Muslim lands, they have scholars, they have muftis, they have qadis, they have qadis, so on and so forth. But if you just take a look at one of the most fruitful, or not one of, but some of the most fruitful countries and the busiest countries in producing books and knowledge and fatawa and ulama and so on and so forth, universities and students, where do we find it? We find it in the Gulf. There's no doubt about that. Whether you call it the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf, whatever the case may be. You look at Saudi Arabia, you look at Kuwait, you look at Qatar, you look at these different oil-rich countries and how many volumes of books they've produced, how many fatawa, how many muftis have the ability to teach day and night and not worry about someone threatening them now worrying about working and going here and doing this and bribery and so on and so forth. Because they have the wealth. They've given them wealth. Pay them. Take care of them. Make them comfortable to teach the people. And not have to worry about those other things. So there's no accident. There's no mistake why Sheikh Ibn Baz rahimahullah, gave thousands and thousands of fatawa. And wrote all types of books. There's no mistake in accident why Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin wrote all of those books. And gave all of those fatawa. There's no mistake behind that. There's no mistake behind that because they didn't have to worry about running here and running there. They had safety. They didn't have to worry about Rafida and people trying to kill them and blow them up and assassinate them. They didn't have to worry about these things. And they didn't have to worry about their food, their drink. They didn't have to worry about warmth and coolness. Those things were provided for them, for them to do what they did well. So it's a very important concept for the disciple to understand. You're going to go far Learn and teach by the more or by the time that you have to study, to learn and to teach. And you need money. You need wealth. Everybody clear on this. And there are things that have to be avoided as well. People trying to buy you out. People trying to hold things over you. And then the list goes on. Okay, that's all a long lecture in itself. But we have to shed light upon it. Moving forward. Ibn Rajah Ibrahim al he then says... And the people of beneficial knowledge, 
He says, whenever they get more ilm, they become even more humble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more fearful of Him, the sublime and the exalted. As some of the pious predecessors said, the alim should place dirt on his head out of humbleness. So, O oh, seeker of knowledge, if you want to know a commonly asked question, how do I know I'm learning correctly? How do I know I'm benefiting correctly? How do I know that I've actually graduated and I'm ready to go back and teach and so on and so forth? From the signs of this is what? Is that you grow even more humble. You finish another book, you feel lower to the ground. You learn more, you get more, you look at yourself as being nothing, even more. Mm, pay very close attention to this. He then says, so every time you get ill of your Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he says you have more fear of Allah, more love of Allah, uh, and you feel more broken in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He then says here, وَمِنْ عَلَامَاتِ الْعِلْمِ النَّافِعِ أَنَّهُ يَدُلُّ صَاحِبَهُ عَلَى الْحَرْبِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَعَظَمْهَ الرِّيَاسَةُ وَالشُّحْرَةُ وَالْمَدْحِ فَالتَّبَاعُدْ عَنْ ذَلِكَ وَالْإِشْتِهَادِ فِي مُجَانَبَتِهِ مِنْ عَلَامَاتِ الْعِلْمِ النَّافِعِ فَإِنْ وَقَعَ شَيْءٌ مِنْ ذَلِكَ مِنْ غَيْرِ قَصْدٍ وَاخْتِيَانٍ كَانَ صَاحِبُهُ فِي خَوْفٍ شَدِيدٍ مِنْ مَعَاقِبَتِهِ بِحَيْثُ أَنَّهُ يَخْشَى أَنْ يَكُونَ مَكْرًا وَاسْتِدْرَاجًا كَمَا كَانَ الْإِمَامُ أَحْمَدُ يُخَافُ ذَلِكَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ إِنْ اشْتِهَارِ اسْمِهِ وَبُعْدِ صِيتِهِ He says here, and from the signs of beneficial knowledge, is that a person, he runs away from the worldly life. And the greatest of the dunya, he says, is riasa, leadership. A person being in charge and being the head. And a person becoming famous. And a person becoming uh, critically acclaimed and applauded and lauded by the people. He says, so therefore, a person running from this and staying away from this to the best of his ability is from the signs of benefit to knowledge. If this happens, if Allah gives it to you and it, it comes your way, and that's not your intention, that's not what you wanted, then he says, those who get this status, they're always afraid. They're always conscious and conscientious about what's going on. What is this the people are saying about me? These titles, these names, this fame, this and that. What is this? He says, whereas he will fear that this is a plot against him and his tidraj. Perhaps he is being led into punishment and he doesn't realize it. Perhaps it's a means of him being taken and seized by Allah uh -huh, and he doesn't realize it. He says here, just as Imam Ahmad Allah, was very afraid... Uh, when he became extremely famous and when he had a great reputation. Once again, this has to be, there's a balance in this because we have text in the Kitab and the Sunnah, okay, different things which prove that it could be a means of glad tidings and it doesn't necessarily have to be a means of a trick or a plot against you and that Allah is going to punish you. Rather, if you're pious and if you're righteous, if you're studying and you're teaching the people, sister, brother, Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is raising you. Perhaps Allah is giving you status in this life and in the hereafter. Perhaps. So that's not absolute, huh? That is an absolute. And also a very important point is not to declare and determine what are, what's in people's hearts. When a person becomes famous, uh, somebody says about him, oh, he doesn't have any class. Look how famous he is. Oh, he doesn't have any knowledge because he calls himself this and he has this title and so on and so forth. And so on and so forth. You don't know what's in someone's heart, yaqi. Ittaqillah. You don't know what's in someone's qalb. Only Allah Azza wa knows what is in the person's heart. A person may hate fame and fortune. He may hate the titles and the names, but they're given to him. And he can't, he can't stop that or she can't stop that. Okay? So you have to understand things in moderation and in balance. Once more, Ibn Rajab, Ibrahim Allah, he then says, وَمَنْ عَلَامَةَ الْإِلْمِ النَّافِرِ أَنَّ صَاحِبَهُ لَا يَدِعِ الْإِلْمَ We read this already. He says, from the signs of beneficial knowledge, is not to claim to have knowledge and not to be arrogant. Mm, not to be boastful, prideful, nor to call others ignorant, except for those who go against the Sunnah and the people of the Sunnah. Very important point. Not to point name, point fingers, call names, and throw mud upon people. Uh, he's jahil. He's a fool. He's jahil. He's jahil. He's jahil. So who's alim? You, you know, and a whole dunya is ignorant and stupid and foolish. That's unfair. He says, except for those who go against the Sunnah. He didn't say go against the ulama. He didn't say go against this person. He says the Sunnah and the people of the Sunnah. Not the people of this group 
and of this party and of this website, and of this country, of these, he says, the actual sunnah itself. He mentions the sunnah. Moving forward. And even in then, in that case, it's not just permissible all the time and easy and simple just call somebody ignorant. It doesn't work like that. Moving forward. He says, because a person should only speak out of anger for Allah, not anger for himself. And not intending to raise himself. Very important. Refuting someone because you believe that they need to be refuted. And it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for your own personal sake. Everybody clear on this. Not because a person wrote you a letter and he gave you advice clarifying your scientific mistakes. Your scholastic errors. Not some personal crap. Okay? Not some mashed up itch to had thrown onto a plate and say, oh, this is a masail in me that you have went against the sunnah. Itch to had that here, here, a piece there, a piece there, khilaf there, this issue. You throw it on a plate and says, ah, you went against the ijma. La, la, la. None of that rubbish. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actual akhta ilmiya. Actual errors that have been proven by the kitab, by the sunnah, by the ijma. Clear errors. Everybody understand this? Not because someone is better than you or this and that. You refute them for Allah. You hate them for Allah. Hmm? Only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for your own sake. Moving forward. He says here, as for those whose knowledge is not beneficial, then the only thing they stay busy with is takabbur, huh? pride and arrogance, haughtiness. They have knowledge, so I'm above you. I'm an imam. I'm a qadi. I'm a sheikh. I'm a this. I'm a that. I'm a student of knowledge. I'm in this group. Fulan knows me. Sheikh Fulan knows me. He doesn't know you. He says in showing the people that he has virtue over them and claiming that they have ignorance. And he says, and looking down upon people, once again, uh, diminishing others, taking stabs at others. He says, and this is from the ugliest things, the worst things to do. And perhaps he may attribute those ulama who preceded him to be ignorant, foolish, they forgot, they didn't know, so on and so forth. And he loves to praise himself. And he loves for him or himself to be above others and beyond others. And he, wali of billah, has good thoughts of himself and bad thoughts of those who came before him. he then says, and the people of beneficial knowledge are on the exact opposite to this. They're totally different. He says they have bad thoughts about themselves and they have good thoughts about those who came before them from the ulama. And they acknowledge with their tongues and with their hearts the virtue of those who came before them and that they cannot reach their status in their level. Not even come close. He then says, uh, look how beautiful the statement of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah is when he was asked about al qama and Al-Aswad, two of the ulama of the Salaf Salih who came before him. He, he was asked, which, which of the two, who's better, al qama or Aswad? He says, Wallahi, we aren't qualified to mention them, let alone say who's better from among them. Allah Akbar. We are not qualified to mention who's better. Huh? We are, we said we aren't qualified to mention them, to say their name, say their names, let alone to determine and figure out who's better. I don't think we need to give any lectures and talks about this, how widespread this is. Sheikh Fulan, Imam Fulan, 
If Fulan is the most knowledgeable of the ulama, anyone he speaks about, that's it, khalas, it's over, it's done. There's no thinking whatsoever. La, he is the... I don't think we have to mention any examples on how widespread this is. وَكَانَ بِنَ الْمُبَارَكِ إِذَا ذَكَرْ أَخْلَاقَ مَنْ سَلَفَ يُنْشِدْ لَا تُعْرِضَنَّ وَقَالَ لَا لَا تَعْرِضَنَّ لِذِكْرِنَا فِي ذِكْرِهِمْ لَيْسَ الصَّحِيحُ إِذَا مَشَاكَ الْمُقْعَدِ He says here, uh, we don't have no way, or there's no way of our mention and their mentioning coming close. Their dhikr and our dhikr coming close. He says the healthy strong man or the healthy strong animal is not like someone who sits and rests. Mm -hmm. A stallion is not like a donkey or a mule, let alone a sick donkey and a sick mule. A man who's an athlete is not like someone who suffers from chronic sickness sitting in a hospital bed with a needle sticking out of his mouth and a pack of ice on his head. It's not the same as someone who's injured, as someone who's running and leaping. It's not the same. He then says, وَمَنْ عِلْمُهُ غَيْرُ نَافِئٍ فَإِذَا رَعَى لِنَفْسِهِ فَضْلًا عَلَى مَنْ تَقَدَّمَهُ فِي الْمَقَالِ وَتَشَقَّقُ الْكَلَامِ ظَنَّ لِنَفْسِهِ عَلَيْهِمْ فَضْلًا فِي الْعِلْمِ أَوَ الدَّرَجَةَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ لِفَضْلٍ خُسَّ بِهِ عَمَنْ سَبَقَ فَاحْتَرَقَ مَنْ تَقَدَّمَ وَأَزْرَى عَلَيْهِ بِقِلَّةِ الْعِلْمِ وَلَا يَعْلَمُ الْمُسْكِينُ وَأَنَّ قِلَّةَ كَلَامِ مَنْ سَلَفَ إِنَّمَا كَانَ وَرَعًا وَخَشْيَةً لِلَّهِ وَلَوْ أَرَادَ الْكَلَامُ وَإِطَالَتُهُ لَمَا عَجَزَ عَنْ ذَلِكَ كما قال ابن عباس لقوم سمعهم يتمارون في الدين أما علمتم أن لله عبادا أسكتتهم خشية الله من غير عين ولا بكم وإنهم لهم العلماء الفصحاء والطرقاء النبلاء والنبلاء العلماء بأيام الله غير أنهم تذكروا عظمة الله طاشت لذلك عقولهم وانكسرت قلوبهم وانقطعت ألسنتهم حتى إذا استفاقوا من ذلك يشارعون عن الله بالعمال الزاكية يعدون أنفسهم من المفرطين وإنهم الأكياس وإنهم لأكياس أقوياء ومع ظالمين والخاطئين وإنهم لأبراب رأى إلا أنهم لا يستكثرون له الكثير ولا يرضون له بالقليل ولا يدلون عليه بالعمال هم حيث ما لقيتهم أو هم حيث ما لقيتهم مهتمون مشفقون وجلون خائفون خرجه أبو نعيم وغيره. He mentions here what he spoke on previously before about those who speak a lot and talk a lot have so much uh, to say it doesn't necessarily mean that they're more knowledgeable than those who came before them. And he mentions a very long effort here of Ibn Abbas. Moving forward. He then says, وأخرج الإمام أحمد وترمذي من حديث أبي أمامة عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال حياء ولعي شعبتان من الإيمان والبذاء والبيان شعبتان من النفاق وحسنه الترمذي وخرجه الحاكم وصححه وخرج ابن محبان في صحيح عن أبي هريرة عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال البيان من الله والعي من الشيطان وليس البيان كثرة الكلام ولكن البيان الفصل في الحق وليس العي قلة الكلام ولكن من سفه الحق وفي مراسيل محمد بن كعب القرضي عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ثلاث ينقص بهن العبد في الدنيا ويدرك بهن في الآخرة ما هو أعظم من ذلك الرحم والحياء وعي اللسان قال عون بن عبد الله ثلاث من الإيمان الحياء والعفاف والعي عي اللسان لا عي القلب ولا عي العمل وهن مما يزدنا في الآخرة وينقصن من الدنيا وما يزيدنا في الآخرة أكبر مما ينقصهن من الدنيا روي هذا مرفوعا من وجه ضعيف وقال بعض السلف إن كان الرجل ليجلس إلى القوم يفيرون أن بي عين وما بي عين وإنه لفقيه مسلم He did mention some more narrations, some hadiths, uh, some athar with regards to um, just because a person doesn't talk and doesn't speak doesn't necessarily mean that he's weak and that he can't talk and he can't speak and he has no knowledge. Uh, and these athar, these hadith specifically, are not necessarily authentic. And he mentions some other athar. We've mentioned this already and explained that as well. Now, and there has to be detail in this as well because for a person to just come and sit down and be quiet and don't say anything, okay, and then he says, well, this is the way of the salaf. And this is the way of beneficial knowledge. Obviously, no man with intelligence is going to accept that. 
you went overseas and you studied in Medina and you're not going to say anything. Sometimes, yes, be quiet. Sometimes don't say anything. Refrain from talking. They're ignorant people around and don't respect knowledge. Your statement is not going to be accepted. Things like this. But just not to teach the people. Okay? Which some brothers, they do. They still go back to their homes. Say, why don't you do classes? Oh, well, uh, I have my own sins to worry about. Or Ibn Rajab said, we shouldn't talk. Huh? Or someone who does teach the people and does give beneficial knowledge. Then they say, oh, he doesn't have no fear of Allah because he's talking. He doesn't have any taqwa because he answers the questions. He doesn't have no fear. That's wrong and that's incorrect as we explained before. And from the greatest proofs uh, that show the validity of what we just said is this book that we're reading. If that was Ibn Rajab's approach, then he wouldn't have done what? He wouldn't have wrote this book. Nor his other explanations and other books that he wrote, which are abundant. The volumes of books that Ibn Rajab wrote. Okay? And these people that he's quoting, Ibn Abbas and these Sahaba, how much knowledge did Ibn Abbas give? How many fatawa did Ibn Abbas give? How much for tafsir of the Qur'an did Ibn Abbas do? So we have to be mindful, huh? We have to be what? We have to be mindful of that. And everything is the balance and moderation. Khayran, inshallah. He then says, Rahimahullah, فَمَنْ عَرَفَ قَدْرَ السَّلَفِ عَرَفَ أَنَّ سَكُوتُهُمْ عَمَّا سَكَتُ عَنْهُ مِنْ دُرُوبِ الْكِلَامِ وَكَاثَةِ الْجِدَالِ وَالْخِصَامِ والزيادة في البيان على مقدار الحاجة لم يكن عين ولا جهلا ولا قصورا وإنما كان ورعا وخشية لله وشغالا عما لا ينفع بما ينفع وسواء في ذلك كلامهم في أصول الدين وفروعه وفي تفسير القرآن والحديث وفي الزهد والرقائق والحكم والحكم والمواعظ وغير ذلك مما تكلموا فيه فما سانك سبيلهم فقد اهتدى ومن سارك غير سبيلهم ودخل في كثرة السؤال والبحث والجدال والقيل والقال فإن اعترف لهم بالفضل وعلى نفسه بالنقص كان حاله قريبا وقد قال إياس بن عوية ما من أحد لا يعرف عيب نفسه إلا وهو أحمق قيل له فما عيبك قال كثرة الكلام وأن ادعى لنفسه الفضل ولمن سبقه النقص والجهل فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا وخسر خسرانا عظيما وفي الجملة ففي هذه الأزمان الفاسدة أما أن يرضى الإنسان لنفسه أن يكون عالما عند الله أو لا يرضى إلا بأن يكون عند أهل الزمان عالما فرضي بالأول فليكتفي بعلم الله فيه ابن رجب رحمه الله تعالى he then says reiterating these points uh, once more once again because of their importance uh, that those who know the true value of the Salaf al-Salih, they know that the things that they didn't speak on, and when they refrained from speech, and when they didn't go on long, extensive detail, it wasn't weakness, it wasn't ignorance, it wasn't fear, it wasn't lack of ability, but it was piety and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm? And also, uh, them staying busy with that which was beneficial. Regardless, whether they spoke on the Aqidah and Iman, Tawheed, Hadith, Zuhd, Tafsir, uh, Wisdom, admonishing the people, etc. He says, so those who follow their way, huh? he says, then they'll be, they'll be guided. And those who follow other than the way, and they'll begin to ask abundant questions, abundant research, argument, uh, arguments, fighting, quarreling, this and that, qeed and qal. He said, she said, this one, that one, Imam, Alan, Abu Fulan, Ibn Fulan, and Fulani. He says here, then that's going to be a problem. If they give the, if they acknowledge the virtue of those who came before them, then perhaps, and he says, and look down on themselves, perhaps they'll be close. He then says here, and this is a very important statement, Iyas ibn Muawiyah, he said, uh, anyone who doesn't know his weakness, the ayyib of himself, he says, is ahmaq, he's a fool. He was asked, what is your weakness? What is your deficiency? What do you lack? Or what's your problem? He says, kathratun kalam. He says, I talk too much. He says here, those who claim to have virtue above and beyond those who came before them, then they're clearly ignorant. And they are astray. And they're losers. He then says, and in brief, during these uh, corrupt times, uh, corrupt times, unfortunately, and this is the time of Ibn Rajab, let alone 2016, he said that a person 
will either be pleased of him being a alim with Allah unto Allah or not. And he must be an alim among the people. He says, if he's pleased with the first, then he should suffice himself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge of him. That's very problematic, of course. Yani, what does that mean? To be an alim of Allah and no one, nobody, no one to know of you being an alim. Kaif hana? How is this? One may ask the question. Rather, this may open up the door for something very dangerous. A person, he says, I'm an, I'm an alim of Allah. How does a person even really go to that status and saying or status that I'm an alim of Allah, aslan? After everything that Ibn Rajiv just mentioned, let alone the fact that what good is the knowledge that you have of abundance and you don't teach it, you don't give it to no one, you don't pass to anyone, you don't defend the deen. So, so we have to be mindful. We have to be mindful. وَمَنْ كَانَ بَيْنُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ مَعْرِفَ اِكْتَفَى بِمَعْرِفَةِ اللَّهِ إِيَّا وَمَنْ لَمْ يَرْضَى وقال ومن لم يرضى إلا أن بأن يكون عالما عند الناس دخل في قول صلى الله عليه وسلم من طلب العلم ليباهي به العلماء أو يماري به سفهاء أو يصرف به وجوه الناس إليه فليتبوء مقعده من النار وقال وهيب بن ورد رب عالم يقول للناس عالم هو معدون عند الله من الجاهلين إذن سيز رحمه الله تعالى once again uh, if he's not pleased with him being عالم of Allah Mm -hmm. And Allah knowing him And he has to be an alim among the people I have to be known and acknowledged Then he will be included in the Prophet ﷺ statement Of the hadith that was previously mentioned Those who seek knowledge He says here uh, To bump shoulders with the ulama And to argue with the sufaha And to turn the people's faces towards them he should take their seats in the fire of hell Wahib ibn Ward said, perhaps an alim that the people say, alim is jahil with Allah and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa fi sahih muslim, an abhi huraita, an nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an qala, inna awala man tusa'ar bihim un naru thalatha, ahaduhum man qara'an qur'ana wa ta'alam al ilma li yuqala huwa qari'un wa au huwa alim, yuqalu lahu qad qila thalik, thumma umira bihi, fu yushabu ala wajhi hata urqiya fi nnar, fa idha lam taqna, نفسه بذلك حتى تصل درجة الحكم بين الناس حيث كان أهل الزمان لا يعظمون من لم يكن كذلك ولا يلتفتون إليه فقد استبدل الذي هو أدنى بالذي هو خير وانتقل من درجة العلماء إلى درجة الظلماء ولهذا قال بعض السلف لما أريد على القضاء فأبا إنما تعلمت العلم لأحشر به مع الأنبياء لا مع الملوك فإن العلماء يحشرون مع الأنبياء والقضاة يحشرون مع الملوك ولا بد للمؤمن من صبر قليل حتى يصل به إلى راحة طويلة فانجزع ولم يصبر فهو كما قال ابن مبارك من صبر فما أقل ما يصبر ومن جزع فما أقل ما يتمتع وكان الإمام الشافعي رحمه الله ينشد يا نفس ما هي إلا صبر أيام كأن مدتا أضغاث أحلامي يا نفس جوزي عن الدنيا مبادرة وخلي عنها فإن العيش قدامي فنسأل الله تعالى علما نافعا ونعوذ به من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن نفس لا تشبع ومن دعاء لا يسمع اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من هؤلاء الأرباع الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين ابن رجب رحمه الله concluding the book he says um, and in Sahih Muslim there's the hadith of Abi Hurairah رضي الله عنه which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the very first people for whom the hellfire will be brought to a blazing kindle are three types, three people. He says, the first is the one whom Allah Azza wa Jal gave the Qur'an. And he taught knowledge, he gave him knowledge. Uh, and it is said, he's Qari or he's Alim. And it will be said to him that this was said to you. People called you these names and these terms. You were pleased and you loved it and you wanted it. And then he will be commanded, thrown upon his face. And then uh, the command will be given for them to drag him uh, until they throw him in the fire. Why the other He says, therefore, those who aren't pleased uh, and they want more. He says, there's, there's still not enough. Now they want to be in charge of people. 
They want to rule and judge among people. They want to become qadis. I must be a qadi. He says, whereas many people of these times, they don't respect an alam until he's a qadi. They don't respect him until he's a qadi. Or today, somebody may not give respect until he's a doctor. If you don't have a PhD, a doctor in front of your name, you don't get any respect. You can't teach. Huh? You can't give any knowledge. You're ignorant. You're, you're, you're not qualified until you have a doctor's degree. Many people, they say things like this, unfortunately. Unless you have a certificate, you can't do anything. There's no benefit or knowledge that you can spread. Hmm? He says here, once a person does this, then they're totally jammed up. He says, then they have given that which is best in exchange for that which is most base. The highest... For the lowest, he says. They've made this exchange. Hmm? And he's one, he went from the ulama to being among the dhalama, the wrongdoers and the oppressors. Uh, and for this reason, some of the Salah of Salah, they said, uh, when they were requested to be judges, they wanted, yeah, and some of the uh, government officials wanted them to be qadis. And obviously, if a person is a qadi, then he's a part of the government. And he has to work for the government one way or another, whether he realizes it or not. He says, uh, I only, or they said, I only learned this knowledge to be gathered among the MBA, not the kings and the sultans. Uh, and this is because the ulama, on the day of resurrection, they will be gathered among the prophets, among the MBA and the qudat. The judges will be gathered among the kings. Very dangerous situation when you enter into these different positions. You take these different types of status, these different uh, jobs. Very dangerous. Once again, it is not absolute because a person can be a judge and he can be a just judge. He can be just and pious. A person can be a judge preventing a wrongdoer from becoming a judge. Preventing someone who's going to take the bribe. Someone who's going to lie. Someone who's going to... Uh, uh, yeah, and he make judgments that are unfair. Hmm? That, uh, the, the, he's not going to practice equality among the people with regards to things in which they are equal in the law of Sharia, but give precedence to this one because of age, because of gender, because of race, because of nationality, because of skin color, etc. Take money on the side. Someone could say this. And the general concept of if the righteous, pious people, they don't have any positions. They don't take no leadership. They don't do anything. Then what will happen when the wrongdoers take it? The imam is a fasik. This alim is a fajr. This qadi is a munafiq. This one is that. He's that. Then what? We can't just sit back and cry and whine and say all of the evil people have taken over the country. They've taken over the city. They've taken over the masjids. And we sit back and twiddle our thumbs. So we have to understand that as well. Ibn Rajab Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he then makes a very excellent point by saying, is it must that the believer have a little bit of patience for him to have a great deal of relaxation. A little bit of sabr, he says, for a great deal of fun, a great deal of raha, to relax and sit back. And that is because uh, if he doesn't have the necessary sabr, and he gives up and he quits and he loses, then he will be like Ibn al-Mubarak said. He says, those who, he says, Man sabara fama aqal ma yasbir. He says, look how quick and short their patience is. It's just a little bit. And those who despair, it's just a little bit of fun that they have. Allahu Akbar. The dunya is short. It's quick. Just be a little patient. And you have a lot of good, inshallah. And if you're not patient, if you give in, if you succumb, then you only have a little bit of joy in the dunya. And that's it. In the grave, in the hereafter, you have misery. But like, this is a golden rule. A golden rule. Especially for the knowledge seeker. Akhi, you're overseas in Egypt. You're overseas in Saudi. Wherever you are studying, starving, hungry, cold, away from your family, tired, stressed, lonely. Your wife is complaining. Your wife is still in America. Your wife is in the UK. You don't have everything that you need, everything that you want. Just be a little patient. A year will go by, two years will go by, five years will go by. And you've learned the Quran. You've memorized Sayyid Bukhari. You've memorized Sahih Muslim. You graduated from school. Your Sheikh gave you ijazah. 
It's just a little bit of sabr that you have and you go back, bithinillah, and you have raha. Bithinillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't forget this old student of knowledge, old hadith disciple. A little bit of patience. Bithinillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He then says, An Imam Shafi rahimahullah, he used to quote some lines of poetry regarding this. Moving forward, concluding the book, he says, We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for beneficial knowledge. And we seek refuge in him from knowledge which does not benefit from a heart that doesn't have any submissiveness from a soul which is insatiable and from a dua which is never heard and never answered. Oh Allah, we seek your refuge from these four things. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam ajma'in. And this, walillahi alhamd, concludes the brief summarized study of this book. Uh, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what he has allowed us to do our humble efforts, uh, wallahi, simple, humble efforts that he has allowed us to put forth. We ask him to accept it from us, accept it from you, and to allow us to benefit from the book and constantly read the book and study the book and revise the book because of ex extremely important points that he mentioned in this book. Okay? And hopefully, perhaps, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll have more time to mention and study more books with regards to the etiquettes, the do's and the don'ts of seeking knowledge. My personal advice to all the disciples is to study and revise these lessons, listen to these points, and most importantly, do what we've tried to do, what we've tried to do is to apply them to the modern times. Apply what he said then to what's going on now, to, with yourself, with your friends, the internet, the people, the websites, the battles and the wars, the shakes, this and that. You're seeking of knowledge, your da'wah, your teaching, your masjid, your community. Apply it to modern times and benefit from his words and benefit from our humble commentary. Bidinillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you very much. Jazakumullahu khairan.